Jordan, Turkey, Tunisia, Egypt, Pakistan, the United Kingdom, France, the United States. All of these countries are witnessing massive protests. And most of these protesters have the same war cry, Free Palestine. Free, free Palestine, you are hiding genocide. Free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine. Why do we want? Why do we want it? Yeah. If we don't get it, shame on you, shame on you. Ever since the war broke out, there's been a lot of talk about Palestine, about Palestinians, about the Palestinian cause. But what exactly is Palestine? How many people live there? Who rules Palestine? And what do the people of Palestine want? Hello and welcome. I'm Palki Sharma. And on this show, we'll try to read between the lines, the stated and the unstated, the obvious and the hidden, to bring you the full story. To understand the Israel-Palestine conflict, you must understand its history and geopolitics. We covered that yesterday, you can watch it here. Tonight we want to talk about the Palestine of today. If you Google it now, you'll find links about the war. But before the conflict, this is what showed up. Three top searches and they were all questions. So I guess that's a good place to start to tell you the story of Palestine in 10 questions. First of all, what is Palestine? Today, Palestine is made up of two parts, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. They do not share a border with each other. But together, they make up the state of Palestine as we know it today, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. The total area is more than 6,000 square kilometers. Question number two, where is Palestine located? Let's pull up the map for this one and zoom into West Asia. You can see the state of Israel and the two parts of Palestine. It lies in the southern Levant. What's Levant? A geographical term to signify areas in the eastern Mediterranean. This is the Gaza Strip. It has the Mediterranean on the west, Egypt on the south, and Israel on the north and east. Then you have the West Bank. It has Jordan on the east and Israel on the north, south, and west. So you have two fragments of land. Together, do they form a nation? Well, they do, according to the United Nations. In all of its documents, the UN refers to it as the state of Palestine. Plus 139 countries recognize Palestine as a nation. Is India among them? Yes, it is. India was in fact one of the first countries to recognize the Palestinian state. Two Indian prime ministers have visited it. The first was Jawaharlal Nehru. He visited Gaza in 1960 to meet Indian troops deployed by the United Nations. But back then, Gaza was under the control of Egypt. And the second Indian Prime Minister to visit was Narendra Modi. He went to Ramallah in 2018. So technically, he became the first Indian Prime Minister to visit Palestine. And India recognizes Palestine. It shares strong bilateral relations. India has built schools and hospitals in Palestine. It also funds several projects in both West Bank and Gaza. Now, if so many countries recognize Palestine as a nation, it must have some markers like a flag, a passport, a capital. Does Palestine have them? Well, it does have a flag, this one, often seen in protests across the globe. They also have a passport. It is issued to residents of Palestinian territories, also to Palestinians born abroad. As for the capital, it's the most contentious part. Palestine says Jerusalem is its capital, but so does Israel. And this is a major flashpoint. It has led to clashes, killings, and widespread violence because both Israel and Palestine want control of the holy city. The question is why? Why do they want the same capital? And the answer is East Jerusalem. It is home to some of the holiest sites in the world. It is where Judaism's two sacred temples once stood. It is also the site where Prophet Muhammad is said to have ascended to heaven. And this is a problem because both sites are on the same land, the Al-Aqsa and the Temple Mount. They're in the same compound. And they have a precarious power-sharing deal. Jordan is the custodian of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It's a third party. Jordan is the custodian of the mosque. Israel controls access to it. 
Jews are allowed to enter, but they cannot pray there. Only Muslims can pray inside the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Like I said, it is precarious power sharing. And this makes the Al-Aqsa a recurring flashpoint. Speaking of which, there's also conflict over who rules Palestine, and it's quite complicated. We'll try to break it down for you. In 1948, the Jewish state of Israel was created. This led to the mass displacement of Palestinians. They call it the Nakba. The Palestinians were left with nowhere to go. They became refugees. Many of them moved to settle in other countries. These diaspora Palestinians formed what they call the Fateh Party, a secular political party. It was founded in 1959 in Kuwait. One of the main founders was Yasser Arafat. He went on to become the president of Palestine, also the biggest name in the Palestinian freedom struggle, Yasser Arafat. So there was Fatah, a party made for Palestinians. And then came the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, an umbrella group founded in 1964 in Cairo, Egypt. The PLO had many parties, but they had one cause, the liberation of Palestine. And for the next three decades, it was the voice of Palestine. But then came the Oslo Accords in the 1990s, a peace agreement between Israel and Palestine signed by two men, Yasser Arafat, the chairman of PLO, and Yitzhak Rabin, the prime minister of Israel. The deal was brokered by Bill Clinton, who was then the president of America. The Oslo Accords were supposed to be a game changer to initiate future peace talks and to lead to a two-state solution, one state of Palestine and one of Israel. Israel was led by its government. On the Palestinian side, they created something called the PA, the Palestinian Authority. And these two sides were supposed to negotiate, but it did not work out. In the years that followed, the peace process broke down, negotiations stopped, and then began an uprising. The year was 2000. Palestinians rose in protest. They called it the Second Intifada. The first one happened in the 1980s. It was largely spontaneous. The second one began in the year 2000, and the trigger was this. Ariel Sharon, a man who became the Prime Minister of Israel, he decided to go to the Al-Aqsa Mosque. He was there for about 45 minutes, and that visit was the spark that lit the powder keg. The region collapsed into chaos. There were protests, rocket attacks, and suicide bombings. The Palestinian Authority refused to rein in its people, and Israel hit back with force. In the end, 1,000 Israelis and 3,200 Palestinians were killed. The second intifada was the final nail in the coffin of the peace process. Israel's focus shifted from peace to its own security. On the Palestinian side, Yasser Arafat died. The year was 2004. And the man who took over was Mahmoud Abbas. He's still the president of Palestine. Their last election was held in the year 2006, and it split Palestine into two political parts. The West Bank went to the PA, the Palestinian Authority. But Gaza was a different story. In Gaza, Hamas won the election. Now, what was Hamas? It started as an Islamic resistance movement. It was formed in 1987 during the first Intifada as an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Now, unlike the PA, Hamas did not accept Israeli statehood. It also vehemently opposed the Oslo Accords. And here's the fun fact. For a while, Israel backed Hamas. They supported it to weaken the Palestinian Authority, and it worked for them then. The people of Gaza voted for Hamas. The Palestinian Authority tried to thrash out a power-sharing agreement, but it did not work. Factional fighting broke out. Many people were killed. In the end, they decided Hamas would rule Gaza and the PA would control the West Bank. So one state, two rulers, and a whole lot of confusion. You see, many countries do not recognize Hamas. Others have designated them as a terrorist organization. So when they talk to Palestine, they talk to the PA and Mahmoud Abbas. And that means Gazans have no effective representation. Which brings us to question nine. How many people are we talking about? There are some 5.3 million Palestinians, 3.1 million in the West Bank and 2.2 million in the Gaza Strip. And then they have the diaspora. More than 6 million Palestinians live around the world. What do all these people want? That's question 10 for you. They want a free Palestine. But what does that mean? What does free Palestine mean? Palestinians say they've been living under Israeli occupation since 1967. They have limited control over their own affairs, from their jobs to their travel. Everything is controlled by Israel. 
Their economy depends on Israel. So does food and aid. In Gaza, even electricity and water supply is controlled by Israel. Palestinians do not want that. Unfortunately for them, when a terrorist group claims to espouse their cause and use Gazans as human shields, their chances shrink further. The story of Palestine is a very complex one. Very hard to distill in 10 questions. We've tried our best, but if you have more questions, do write to us.